Heather, and you're watching Crime and Court, and this is episode 10 of the Canton cover-up Karen, uh, the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed, and we're going to talk about, or continue to talk about, the exculpatory evidence, because this is part two. If um, you didn't watch part one, I would suggest that you watch that. We're going through a list of the top 27 reasons why Karen is innocent and why there is an undeniable cover-up of John O'Keefe's murder. So I am going over the, um, this is actually a Turtle Boy blog that he put out and he did a countdown of his top 27 reasons why John O'Keefe's ending his unaliving is part of a cover-up and we already went through numbers 27 through six uh 16 last time and we're picking up where we left off and that is at number 15 so trooper proctor conducted five undocumented searches over a period of three weeks and found tail light on brian albert's lawn every single time so remember, we talked about last time the different uh, times that law enforcement searched the property. We're going to kind of talk about it again. It re it's Some of it is um, repetitive, but it's all in context of the defendant's petition dated the 1st of January 2023. So this is coming from the defense and they are arguing about the taillight searches. So the proving that there were searches done that shouldn't have been done or were undocumented. So significantly, Trooper Proctor's timeline of events as set forth in his sworn affidavit is provably false. Uh, security footage taken from Ms. Reed's parents' residence establishes that Ms. Reed's black Lexus SUV was towed from the driveway by Diamond Towing in Di North Dighton, Massachusetts at 4.12 p.m., not 5.30 p.m., as Trooper Proctor's affidavit suggests. So this is going back to that, f the fact that Trooper Proctor put down 4.30 when we actually have video footage from Mr. Reed's home uh, from his uh, ring camera um, that it was being towed at 412. So we have a whole hour and 18 minute gap there. So the altered timeline means that both the Lexus SUV as well as Trooper Proctor would be unaccounted for during the entirety of that one hour and 18 minute gap between 412 and 5.30 p.m. Thus, Trooper Proctor and certain personnel from the Canton Police Department where the vehicle was towed what had unfettered access not only to Ms. Reed's vehicle and its taillight, but to the crime scene as well for more than an hour before the CERT team ex executed its search of the scene. So remember the... the um, Brian Tully, I believe it was, we talked about, um, he called CERT and said, we, you don't have permission yet to go on scene, but I'm going to need you to go on scene. So stand by, basically. Um, they were, were they potentially waiting for Trooper Proctor or someone to come there and plant taillight? I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, before I forget, please don't forget to like this video, comment, subscribe, share, do all those youtube -y things, please. I really appreciate it. All right, so we're going to continue where we left off here. Um, so they had unfettered access. Notably, photographs obtained from Facebook establish that Trooper Proctor has a long-standing pre-existing personal relationship with the Albert family. Um, so keep that in mind because we'll talk about that again. That's another point that we'll bring up. 
So sometime, this is the petition continuing, sometime after 5.30 p.m. when the CERT team began executing its search, MSP located for the very first time red and white pieces of plastic on the ground outside of 34 Fairview Road, consistent with the taillight of Ms. Reed's vehicle, which constitutes the only physical evidence against Ms. Reed in this case. So... Yeah, we talked about that. That's the only physical piece of evidence that ties her to the unaliving of John O'Keefe. So they, the Commonwealth really needs the tail light pieces to stick as evidence. Whereas um, it's questionable how those pieces even got there in the first place. And this isn't until the second search that they find... Um, the red and white pieces of plastic consistent with the taillight because remember Canton PD comes first they don't find any taillight they found a broken glass and some droplets of red DNA that they collected in red solo cups after using a leaf blower to, to try to dry out the snow or melt the snow which um it's another thing that just popped into my mind. They were using that leaf blower for two hours, it said, somewhere in some document um, about it. And um, Nicole Albert and Brian Albert both said they never came out. They never heard anything. They never saw anything. And they didn't even come out until after the fire department left. So they slept through all the uh, commotion of looking through the snow and trying to melt it with a snow blower too or i'm sorry with a leaf blower so um take that into your brain and just absorb that because it doesn't make sense to me but if it makes sense to you please let me know how <laughs> i mean i can be a deep sleeper but i think i would wake up for two hours of a loud something or other outside my window anyways continuing on um whoops sometime after 5 30 p.m when the search team began executing its search msp located for the first time the plastic pieces the investigation of the crime scene however did not stop there According to Detective Michael Lank's testimony before the grand jury on February 4th 2022 one full week after O'Keefe's passing uh, Ken Berkowitz, who's the chief of, poli of the Canton Police, purportedly drove by the Fairview residence and saw from his moving vehicle, if that's believable, an additional piece of red plastic that was consistent with the taillight of Ms. Reed's vehicle. It is worth noting that this scene had been searched, researched, and searched again by no fewer than three sets of police officials. Yet Chief Berkowitz claims that he glanced from his moving car while driving, saw a shard of lens material on the ground many yards away, and at speed recognized the shard's evidentiary value and stopped his car to report the finding. One of the officers under the chief's command, Kevin Albert, is 34 Fairview Road homeowner Brian Albert's brother. So, yes, we learned, uh, we did learn this last, um, in the last episode that Kevin Albert is an officer under Chief Berkowitz. So how does that play into the investigation and, um, and a conflict of interest? We know Trooper Proctor is a conflict of interest, so... Uh, Canton Police is, is a conflict of interest too so it seems like the only um, sorry we're, I just bumped okay that's where it was sorry my hand bumped it um, so the only piece of evidence that they do have is um, the taillights so this is a big deal trying to find out how that taillight got there and why there were so many searches and an altered police report to include a third documented search with Chief Berkowitz finding a piece 
of tail light. So it's this is a big deal in as far as evidence goes for Karen and the fact that the video footage from the Canton Library is missing. The two minutes that she would have been driving by showing that her taillight was indeed intact when she was leaving the Albert residence. So all of it just really adds up, doesn't it? When you take it piece by piece and lay it out there like uh, Turtle Boy did here. And all I did was just find the documented evidence in the court documents based on what um, his arguments were in his list. So Detective Lang testified that the chief of police then notified the Massachusetts State Police to report what he had discovered. So before state troopers arrived, Canton police officers had already responded to the scene and taken photographs of what the chief of police claimed to have found on Fairview Road at on February 4th. So this is five five days later and um the chief just happens to be driving by and finds red taillight a piece one one piece of red taillight after this place has been searched so many times so i don't know if that's believable um and the fact that um, massachusetts state police assumed jurisdiction of the investigation on january 29th sometime after um, they found out that John O'Keefe had succumbed to his injuries. Um, so when a grand juror asked specifically why the chief of Canton police had responded to the Fairview residence and how he discovered the evidence, Detective Link explained, quote, nobody called the chief, end quote. So the chief just showed up. He just inserted himself into this uh, case, this investigation, when it was not their jurisdiction. Which makes you wonder, why? I don't know. Um, so nobody called the chief. When pressed further by the juror as to why he, quote, just wandered over there, Detective Lank recounted, quote, he was driving down Fairview Road and saw it, the evidence. End quote. So in sum, the evidence establishes that the Lexus taillight lens was in fact not shattered at Brian Albert's house at or around 12.15 a.m. Rather, it was cracked when it struck the Chevy Traverse at Mr. O'Keefe's residence at 5.07 a.m., hours after O'Keefe's Unt untimely passing um pieces of miss reed's taillight were not found during the initial police search conducted by canton police in the early morning hours of january 29th pieces of the taillight were subsequently located after trooper proctor had taken possession of miss reed's vehicle one hour and 18 minutes earlier than he swore in his affidavit so He's lying or all ring footage or whatever it was. Alarm.com footage is incorrect. I don't know. So additional pieces of the taillight were uncovered several days later on February 4th, 2022, as Canton Police Chief Berkowitz, whose department had relinquished jurisdiction of the investigation, drove by in a police cruiser, recognized pieces of taillight at speed in his cruiser, and called Canton police to the scene. Just none of it makes sense, right guys? I mean, it's just all shady. That's what I think. All right, so moving on to number 14. Colin Albert's existence at the party wasn't included in Proctor's reports. He had no documented alibi, previous animosity towards O'Keefe, and wasn't questioned by police until appearing in front of a grand jury 18 months later. So that is a lot. Let's break that down. So nobody can tell us when exactly Colin left the house. Um... All we were told was that he arrived at his home at 
I think it was like 1230, 1231, something like that. And um, we know he was at the Albert home originally, and that was only like slipped in. Um, we only knew that because it slipped in grand jury testimony, I believe, or something along those lines, because um, everybody was just denying that he was there. So why deny so hard? Oh, boy. Sorry about that. My dogs heard something. They're still barking. Sorry. Okay. They're sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> they scare me when they bark. Um, they heard a noise. So I don't remember what I was saying now. Totally interrupted me. So pieces of taillight were not found by Canton police and then all of a sudden they were found by Trooper Proctor. He had possession eighteen uh, one hour and 18 minutes earlier than he swore in his affidavit was when he uh, took possession of Karen Reed's car. So additional pieces of taillight were uncovered several days later as Canton Police Chief Berkowitz, whose department had relinquished jurisdiction, um, found it on his way just driving in his car. Here we go. Colin Albert, sorry. <laughs> My dogs. Um, so Colin Albert uh, doesn't... Um, well, we are told that he... First, we were told that he wasn't in the house, and then we were told... Finally, it slipped that he was in the house, but then he left before everybody, and it's there's no real explanation and as you can see to if you go back into my timeline episode we don't have a specific time no one ever says a specific time when Colin leaves the house so I think that's important I think Jen McCabe drove him home but that's my opinion because I noticed that you know, well her cell phone was near John O'Keefe's house near this, his street, at least, we know, um, at some point in the night when she was driving home, uh, Brian Albert Jr.'s friends. So we, and we know Colin Albert lived right down the street or on the same block or I don't know. He lived, he was a neighboring house of John O'Keefe's because they had animosity. Colin threw garbage all over his yard and all that. So there, there were issues there. So and there's a lot that has to do with Colin and no specific alibi and no specific time in which he leaves and no specific time or video of when he arrives home, you know, nothing that can corroborate that he arrived home at this point. Um, So here's what, um, according to the defendant's petition in October of 2023, um, Col Colin Albert supposedly returned home to his parents' residence at approximately 1230 a.m. But this is coming from, I believe, grand jury testimony. So we do not know. If that's corroborated, we don't have uh, specifics as to when Colin actually did get home. So that's problematic. Number 13, Brian Albert's house was never searched despite a deceased cop on his lawn. These are all Turtle Boy's words, so I'm cleaning it up so YouTube, it's more YouTube friendly because they do censor. Um, so... Uh, Brian Albert's house was never searched despite the fact that a deceased cop on the front of on the front lawn and Reed's testimony stating that she dropped him off there. So uh, her testimony alone stating that she dropped O'Keefe off there and and left should indicate to law enforcement that they sh these this house should be searched if anything treated if not treated like a 
a suspect, the people inside, if they're not treated like suspects, at least question them, find out what, um, you know, the homeowners find out what happened, go inside, look if there was, you know, some kind of scuffle or, you know, some kind of something nefarious going on. But they didn't do that. Um, So this is a Karen Reed's statement to Troopers Proctor and Buchanan. And of course, this is in their words, um, reiterated back to us. So this is what they say she said. The troopers were invited into the home and observed the defendant seated on the living room couch. The defendant agreed to speak with the troopers. The defendant indicated to the troopers that she had met the victim at C.F. McCarthy's bar in Canton at approximately 9 p.m. the evening prior. So the victim had been there with his friends prior to her showing up there, which we know. So she met them there and then the two of them, um, so she was drinking vodka sodas and he was drinking beers and I highlighted that because that comes into play in my mind later when they find a cocktail glass at the scene but he was drinking beer so he'd either have a beer bottle or a beer stein in my opinion depending on what uh, how they served it at the bar how he preferred it I don't know am I wrong am I right who drinks beer out of a cocktail glass So anyways, back to what Karen said. Um, She described that the glassware she was drinking out of was a vase style. So she's got a vase. He's drinking beers, but we don't know if he was drinking out of a beer or uh, some kind of a mug. The defendant stated that she and the victim left C.F. McCarthy's and went to the waterfall, but denied that she ever took a drink in with her to the next bar. She stated that they were at waterfall for approximately an hour, and during that time, there were no argument, arguments amongst anyone present there. When she and the victim were leaving the waterfall, she stated they were invited to, the, to a house on Fairview Road. The defendant stated that she had dropped the victim at the house on Fairview and went home. She had dropped him off. And since uh, she was having stomach issues at the previous bar, the defendant stated that she dropped the victim off then made a three-point turn. So she admits she made a three-point turn to turn around in the street, and then she drove away. She stated that she did not see the victim enter the residence, and the victim indicated, I'm sorry, the defendant indicated that she first observed the broken taillight in the morning and did not know how she had broken it the previous evening so if it hadn't been broken that evening she wouldn't have seen it right so she didn't notice it until after the 507 a.m on the 29th when it happened the victim was uninjured when she dropped him off at the house however when she discovered him the next morning she observed him lying face up snow on his legs his eyes swollen and blood coming from his nose and mouth She stated that she began providing him mouth-to-mouth. The defendant further stated that she had attempted to contact the victim throughout the night, calling and texting him numerous times with no response. So she and Jen McCabe were texting and calling him with no response all night. Uh, She stated that she had a verbal argument that morning over what the defendant fed the victim's niece breakfast so maybe Karen served pancakes and John wanted her to serve eggs and oatmeal or something I don't know whatever the case may be they had a, a, an argument I'm sure it wasn't like a big blowout argument where you would want to run your partner over anyways um, <laughs> number 12 the 911 call shows authentic shock from Reed, little concern from Jim McCabe, no mention to the dispatcher that she that she's at her sister's house and McCabe whispering a message to Nicole Albert about coming uh, oh I, I spelled that whoops about coming out to help. So um yes, so we hear in the 911, I call, I played it in one of my episodes. I'm going to play it again here in a second, but I just wanted to describe, um, 
describe it one more time. So the we hear this is the this is the phone call that got recorded on John's voicemail because Karen was in the middle of calling John when they were searching for him and his voicemail picked up. She saw his body. She threw her car into the phone without hanging up or ending the call and it started to record the conversation that was happening taking place in the car which was Jennifer McCabe calling 911. So Jen calls 911 and she doesn't mention at all to the dispatcher that she's at her sister's house because she her Jen McCabe is sisters with Nicole Albert. Um so she doesn't mention anything about the fact that she is at her sister's house. She doesn't say anything about the fact that John O'Keefe is her friend or an officer of the law. Nothing. She just, you can hear her on the 911 call say a man's lying unconscious in the snow. And that's how she describes the incident. And um, it is said um, and I did kind of hear it in somebody, I cannot remember who for the life of me had some kind of like cleaned up audio of the 911 call. And, um, you can kind of hear Jen McCabe whispering as she's calling, allegedly she's calling Nicole Albert and asking if she's going to come out and help. So that is something that um, you can listen for and see if you can hear it yourself. Um, yes, I need someone to see 34 and see if, uh, 34 feet of the road is getting out there's a man trapped out in the snow. Yeah, yeah I don't know why he's doing that. I can see that. Okay, I know, I know. Where's the blanket? I don't see the blanket, Terry.
All right. So what do you guys think about that 911 call? Did you hear Karen screaming in the background asking for help? And screaming frantically for Jen and Carrie to help? That was Karen screaming in fear and panic and desperation because someone she loves, she found in the condition that she did and he didn't look good. And um, Carrie and Jen, calm as cu cucumbers, it seems. Especially Jen. I don't know. Did you guys hear any whispering in this version? It might not be as audible in this version. There, You might have to um, seek out the um, cleaned up version where it was enhanced. But it does sound like there might be some whispering, I think, on Jen's uh, end, potentially. But in nowhere did Karen say in there, did I hit him? I hit him. Did I hit him? Right? I mean, I didn't hear that. Did you guys hear that? That's important that that was never said there. But uh, we're told by someone who googled house long to die in cold at 2 27 a.m that uh that she asked her to google that or to um to uh that she said that to her that she hit him and that she googled the or asked her to do the google search but we'll get there. That's another another one coming. So next is 11. So not a single person at the party saw a 6 foot 2, 217 pound body lying feet from the curb with barely any snow despite driving right by where the body was found. I would actually like to contribute that I think with snow it would make it more visible out there. I don't know. Uh, um, snow seems to like lighten things up, especially at night when um, you have like that. It just, it reflects light. So if you do have any street lights or anything around there, it's going to reflect and make the landscape just all that much brighter. So the fact that nobody saw him and he was, wearing you know gray and jeans he would have been standing out Th those colors would have contrasted against the snow so the fact that not a single person saw him lying feet from the curb with barely any snow despite driving right by where his body was found is very hard to believe so the defendant's petition in October states this. In its recitation of the facts, the Commonwealth in also includes the statement of partygoer Juliana Nagel, who was driven home by Jennifer McCabe around 1.30 or 2 a.m. As set forth as res in respondent's opposition, so in a filing from the Commonwealth, they stated that Juliana Nagel purportedly told Trooper Proctor that as she drove away from the house around 1.30 or 2 a.m., she thought that she saw something she described as a, quote, dark object, quote, end quote, in the snow by the flagpole outside Brian Albert's house, but could not tell what it was. Well, that's interesting. This is, we're just finding out now that she told this to Trooper or to Trooper Proctor. The Commonwealth conveniently fails to note the incredibly suspect timing of Ms. Nagel's statement. Notably, on September 19th, 2022, Ms. Reed filed a Rule 17 motion requesting cell records relating to all of the individuals who were present at the Albert residence on the night in question. In support of that request, counsel for Ms. Reed argued... At least six individuals claimed to have left the Albert residence in the early morning of January 29, 2022, 
after Ms. Reed had left the Fairview residence and returned home. Jennifer McCabe and Matthew McCabe purportedly drove Julie Nagel and an unnamed female home at 1.30. We find out later it's uh, somebody named Sarah Levinson. So Brian Higgins is the ATF agent. He supposedly went to complete administrative work at the Canton Police Department around 1.30 a.m., which is odd. After a night of drinking and him and Brian Albert were just in New York. So he was in New York and then drinking. They just got there from a drive-in um, to Massachusetts. I have no idea what that drive would be. All I know is that from Chicago to New York, it's like 12, 13 hours. But um, they drove in from New York that day, Brian Albert and Brian Higgins, and then met up with everybody at the bar at like 9 or 10 o'clock at night. And then he went straight into the P at the Canton PD's office and worked around 3 p 3 a.m. So, or I'm sorry, 1.30 a.m. <laughs> I don't know where I got 3. 1.30 a.m. Sometimes my tongue says things that my brain just isn't telling it to say. <laughs> I have no idea. I love autoimmune diseases. All right, so... Colin Albert supposedly returned home to his parents' residence at approximately 12.30 a.m. Yet, and, and we just talked about that. Um, and so all these people were leaving the Albert residence. Six individuals claimed to have left the Albert residence in the morning of January 29th. Yet none of these individuals, not one, claims to have seen O'Keefe's body sprawled in Brian Albert's front yard mere feet from the roadway all of them would have driven on so they all would have passed his body and none of them saw him so this was in the filing from the de the defense on um 10 27 23 um they're referring back to this but this filing was done prior to that so 7 um September 19th 2022 is when they made this whole statement the defense did okay you got me so september 2022 they came out and said no one saw him even though they'd all drive by so continuing their argument argument in um october 2023 this argument was reiterated vigorously at the hearing on the Rule 17 motion on October 3rd, 2022. Remarkably, two days after the defense made these facts known to the court and to the Commonwealth in a public hearing, on October 5th, so two days later, at 11 a.m., Trooper Proctor met with party goer Juliana Nagel and interviewed her for the very first time, seven months after O'Keefe's passing. In that unrecorded interview, Trooper Proctor claims that Juliana Nagel reported that she, quote, observed a dark object in the white snow by the flagpole, end quote, as she left 34 Fairview Road on the 29th, seven months prior. So is she changing her statement? Is she adding details that were never there? It may appear that way. Number 10, the 10, the number 10 reason why Karen Reed is factually innocent and there is a cover up as to John O'Keefe's unaliving is that Jen McCabe deleted only her calls, texts, and Google searches between 5 and 9 a.m., indicating consciousness of guilt. So at some point in that morning, she decided this is her call log. She decided to delete all of these calls. And these were to Tom Beatty, to somebody named Coco. I think that's um, Nicole Albert, actually. They, um, I believe, it's either Nicole or Julie. They nicknamed her Coco. Uncle Brian, Matt McCabe, Karen, Carrie Roberts. So all of these calls she deleted. Why? 
because she had some kind of consciousness of guilt, it seems. Otherwise, why would you delete your calls? It just, and, but she stopped too, because then she must have realized like, oh crap, what am I doing? And stopped deleting her calls after a certain time. I don't know. What do you guys think? It's very strange. We kind of went over the deleted data in episode nine and how uh, Jen McCabe's, like none of it makes sense. The things she was searching and her Google search to how long to die in cold plus the other multiple searches she did to cover that up. It just, uh, much of it doesn't make sense. And we go over that in uh, episode nine. All right, so Proctor, number nine, Proctor intentionally hid a close long-term family relationship with the Alberts and his boss, Brian Tully, didn't see any problems with this. So Brian Tully, uh, the detective, lieutenant, and um, he's overseeing this whole thing for the Massachusetts State Police and Trooper Proctor and Buchanan also report to Tully and um proctor as we know has had a close relationship with the alberts we've talked about that on multiple occasions here specifically is an image that was posted on social media of trooper proctor pictured with two of matt mckay matt and jen mccabe's daughters i don't know which ones and i covered their faces because they're minors and we don't need to see them but it's proof that he does know these families. The Commonwealth denied that they were McCabe's kids. So the Commonwealth denied their children. (laughs) Here's another photo um, that was found on social media. Trooper Proctor and Colin Albert were both at a wedding together for Courtney Proctor. So I believe this is Colin here and this is um, Trooper Proctor. They're not only at a wedding, attending a wedding, but they are in the wedding party together and um, sitting at the same table even. So for them to say that they don't know one another is ridiculous. Here is a picture also from social media, which was a professionally done photograph of Trooper Proctor's nephews with Colin Albert, who's right here. And, um, yeah, I mean, why would you take a professional photo with someone if you didn't think that they were close, like family? I don't get it. And we also know that Proctor's mother had posted somewhere, I don't have a picture of it, but it was, I think it was told in a, um, one of the oral arguments in a hearing, a motions hearing for this case, that um, the mother, uh, Proctor's mother, had a Facebook post or some kind of social media post saying that uh, she thinks of the Alberts as a second family. So there's that. All right, moving on to number eight. Veteran cop Brian Albert never came out of the house after being alerted about a body on his lawn. So according to the defendant's motion filed in September 2022, one of Canton Police Department's first responding officers on scene, Officer Mullaney, testified that the homeowners of 34 Fairview Road, i.e. Brian Albert, never came outside to interact with anyone at the crime scene or speak to the responding officers. Now, that alone, I think, is just suspicious, right? I mean, you have a body on your lawn and you don't come out and you're a cop. All right, so Brian Albert's statement. When Brian and Nicole left the bar to go home, John and Karen were still inside. Brian stated he did not know John and Karen were coming to his house and were invited by John for McCabe. Brian stated he would have welcomed them inside if they arrived, but did not know that they were coming. Brian stated he did not see a vehicle out front of his house. He did not know John and Karen were outside. 
he did not hear any loud noises from the street. So he didn't know, he didn't hear, he didn't see, nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing to see here moving along. Nicole Albert's statement. Later on, during the morning hours of January 29th, Nicole stated that she was still in bed when her sister Jen came into the room and shared with Nicole what had transpired outside and that John was found deceased on the edge of her property by the street in the snow. So Jen McCabe comes over early in the morning and just wakes Nicole up and says, hey, by the way, an officer from your party last night found, ended up on the deceased in the snow. Just in case you wanted to know. <laughs> I mean, in case you wanted to come out of the house and, you know, answer some questions. Nicole stated that she never left her home and by the time she came downstairs, Canton Fire Department must have transported both John and Karen from the scene. So they were already gone. All right, number seven. Police never investigated who was driving a Ford Edge seen at 3 a.m. in the exact location where O'Keefe's body was found at 6 a.m. despite several Alberts owning a Ford Edge. So... I believe Colin owns one. I believe um, Chris might own one. I'm not sure. I don't want to just throw out names because I don't remember. But I know that there are multiple Alberts that own a Ford Edge. So it could have been a number of them. <laughs> could have been any one of them. And this is according to Brian Lucky Lawfren's statement. He was interviewed by Troopers Sergeant and Buchanan August 2023. So, over a year and a half after John's passing. All right, so Sergeant Buchanan says, Do you remember any uh, obstructions that you had to call in the police for that was obstructing the removal of snow for you that day? Uh, there was a vehicle there um, around 2.33 in the morning in front of 34 Fairview. There was a vehicle? Correct. Okay, do you recall what kind of vehicle it was? Ford Edge. Ford Edge? Yes. I don't think you could get it. Like, Brian Lucky Lawfern is very adamant about his recollection, his, what he remembers, what he saw, how the night was, how, you know, how the events unfolded in front of him. He remembers his recollection. He's, a, I, I feel like he's one of those hardworking blue collar guys that just, um, he takes pride in his work and he really, um, he really wants to be believed because he, he, like his word is good. His, his, um, his recollection and his memory of events is correct. All right, so number six, the FBI wouldn't launch a multi-year investigation into the DA's office, impanel a federal grand jury to question innocent witnesses, keep the DA's office in the dark, and exclusively work with Reed's defense team if they weren't convinced of a cover-up. And that's, there's a lot going on with the federal grand jury, the FBI, that we don't quite know yet because they haven't come out with anything at this time other than some letters but at um, a recent hearing for Karen um, David Unetti her attorney said this immediately after our last court appearance as I promised when I last addressed this court we filed a motion for sanctions against District Attorney Morrissey so sanctions are Oftentimes it's like a, it's a punishment. It's usually money. So a sanction might be, you know, we asked for $10,000 from District Attorney Morrissey's office um, as a sanction. And um, they can, they can do sanctions anytime there's some kind of like misconduct or anything like that. Or apparent misconduct. Or even negligence. So anyways, including a request that his office be disqualified from continuing to prosecute the case. So they're also trying to get District Attorney Morrissey's office disqualified because of several reasons. 
I expect that motion will be heard at our next court date. I can't wait. <laughs> That's me saying that. All right. Um, and he asked that the court consider uh, what that hearing would look like. The hearing will prominently feature the contents of all the eight letters from the feds. So they were talk they were discussing these eight letters that were provided to them by the defense in discovery and they don't it makes it very apparent that the FBI is looking into this case thoroughly and they may perhaps be investigating the investigators of the case and the people prosecuting the case is what the letters appear but I, w I will let you guys figure that out you know you come to your own conclusions when we read them next time but that's going to be episode 11 but before we do that let's finish this quote here so the specific content of those letters is one of the grounds that gave rise to our motion for sanctions in the first place in fact our motion for sanctions liberally quotes from those letters and i assume that's the reason why the sanctions is currently impounded by the court so the court sealed it put a gag on it basically because they didn't want it out into the public because these letters were not public at the time but it is clear from those letters that district attorney morrissey is well aware that he's the target of a federal investigation as a result of his conduct in this case those letters prove that he knew he knew that even before the u.s attorney ever confirmed that there even was an investigation and your honor on that score something very important has come to light just yesterday that directly bears on this issue the norfolk da's office and the karen reed defense team participated in a conference call yesterday with the representative from the u.s attorney's office the u.s attorney confirmed during that conference call confirmed for both parties that not only has there been a federal investigation, but it is ongoing. It is not over. It continues. The DA had this confirmed for them just yesterday, right from the horse's mouth. We have the eight letters. We've seen them. We've read them. We are using them. The genie cannot be put in back in the bottle. Those letters are powerful evidence that we will use to publicly support our motion for sanctions. So they are using these letters to show good cause that the district attorney's office basically has the wrong person and they're trying to um, get, you know, frame someone or basically something along those lines. The letters represent... Um, questions into the investigation and the FBI is aware of it. So not to be outdone, <laughs> District Attorney Michael Morrissey came out following that hearing um, that just took place, so that it took place on the 18th. So just following that hearing, District Attorney Morrissey come, came out and said, no part of the communication with the Office of the United States Attorney yesterday or at any point has indicated that the Norfolk District Attorney or any member of this office is the target of the federal investigation. Mr. Unetti misrepresented that completely. I will let you guys be the judge because we're going to read them next time. Um, but I will say they don't make the district attorney's office look very good. That's all I will say about that. Moving on, number five. And again, if you want a deep dive into the data and the Google searches, please go see my episode um, eight for um, the deleted data. All right, so five. Jen McCabe Googled house long to die in cold deleted it then googled it again at 6 24 in an attempt to hide her 2 27 a.m search that provide that proves there was a conspiracy to end o'keefe because he wasn't unalive at that point he must have still been breathing you know he i'm sure still had a pulse he was still like he was he still was 
breathing slightly when um, EMT arrived at six something in the morning. Um, but had he been treated to treated had his injuries been treated early on he might have survived but the fact that they all left him out in the cold and knew this and put this google search in their phones it, it proves that there was a conspiracy to leave him out there to to until his life ended despite telling the police that she believed he went home so think about that and in that episode eight, we go over this. I'm going to go over it um, just briefly again. So here's an article that she would have pulled up, John McCabe, at 2.27 a.m. or something to this effect. This was like one of the first things that came up when I did a search. And basically, um, you know, it depends on the conditions, how long it takes for hypothermia to kick in. But in the air, hypothermia can develop in as little as five minutes in temperatures of minus 50 below in people who are not dressed properly and have exposed skin. So exposed skin, he didn't have a coat and um, his face, his hands, all that were exposed. He, we don't know if he was found in his gray sweatshirt or not. I don't know, but um he did have a sweatshirt at some point. The temperatures were in the teens. So we're probably here 30 degrees Fahrenheit or negative at negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit or more. Uh, hypothermia can um, occur at about 10 minutes. So death can occur in under an hour in extremely cold conditions. That's about where we're at. Probably about an hour. Symptoms of severe hypothermia. This is when body temperatures are less than 82 degrees and he was about 80 degrees. So we know that. At this stage, his body would have been experiencing stiffness, low blood pressure, muscle rigidity, he would have been passed out or in a coma, unresponsive, the breathing stops, and the heart stops. So that is severe cases of hypothermia. And she would have Googled that. She would have seen that when she Googled how long to die in cold. All right, so shortly after Jennifer McCabe discovered O'Keefe's body and after opening an article in her safari application entitled how long does it take to digest food Jennifer McCabe she's having search issues that morning Jennifer McCabe attempted to overwrite her incriminating early morning search of how long to die in cold by re-entering it at a more appropriate time uh, however in her haste to cover up her incriminating 227 search Ms. McCabe accidentally searched how long T die in sick at two or at 623. Immediately thereafter at 624 a.m., she corrected her search to match the 227 a.m. misspelling and searched how long to die in cold. Uh, notably, in case that sloppy attempt to cover up her incriminating Google search wasn't enough, and in any effort, and in an effort to conceal her own criminality on February 1st, days after O'Keefe's death, Ms. McCabe inexplicably told law enforcement for the first time that as she was sitting alone with Ms. With Ms. Reed in a car after law enforcement had arrived, because remember, law enforcement sat Karen in a car because she was hysterical on scene. People couldn't, like, they couldn't even ask her questions because she was hysterical and wouldn't call down. So they just sat her in a car. So now, days later, Jen McCabe is saying, oh yeah, by the way, um, let me just offer this information to you. While I, while Ms. Reed was sitting in that car after law enforcement arrived, she yelled at me two times how, to Google, how long do you have to be left outside to die from hypothermia? That's her cover, another way to cover her search. So there's that. Number four. We're getting there. We're getting there, guys. All right, number four. 
Canine expert Garrett Wing confirmed uh, O'Keefe's autopsy photos showed dog bites lacked bruising and broken bones that would be consistent with a motor vehicle accident and included facial injuries consistent with being beaten in the head. So graphic warning, we're going to show the autopsy photos one more time. This will probably be the last time I show them, but never say never. So trigger warning, graphic content. This is a photo and evidence of John's arm. These Someone might think they were scratches, but in fact, dog expert Garrett Wing, who was on Melanie, attorney Melanie Little's show on a live stream, they talked about in comparison how other bites, other bite marks um, look very similar. The difference is, or a big key component is, uh, people don't usually succumb to dog bites they don't usually their lives don't end from that so court the medical examiners coroners aren't going to necessarily know how to distinguish the difference between an abrasion of from something and a dog bite especially if he had been laying there for hours in the cold and you know blood congeals and um wounds closing up and whatnot and being in the cold it would probably you know constrict things I'm assuming so a coroner a medical examiner wouldn't know right off the bat that those were dog bites but um, the way that I really recommend watching this episode if you haven't already Garrett Wing um, was an excellent guest and he explained how dog bites often look this way because the dog is pulling backwards and the human is pulling backwards you're both pulling in opposite directions it's going to be a tear the weight of the dog and the pull of the arm it's going to look like John's arm so here are pictures of his head and his you can see his hand bruised looks like he was probably punching someone or something potentially Lots of bruising on his hand. Look how big that is. Black eyes, both eyes seeping from his eyes. Um, so all of his injuries were above the head. Or, uh, I'm sorry, above the neck. So head and neck. And then he had cuts on his arms and hands. Injuries were more consistent with the beating rather than a low impact vehicle collision. He had no lower body injuries which makes no sense if he was struck by a car number three ryan nagel was at 34 fairview road for 10 minutes at the exact time the commonwealth said reed had ended o'keefe but reported seeing reed alone in her car no body on the ground an intact taillight and no signs of a collision he is a huge witness for the defense because he corroborates her story he's the only one there that doesn't have a say in it doesn't have some kind of um something to gain by lying so i take his account very um you know i give it a lot of weight according to ryan nagel's statement Ryan confirmed that he was contacted by Julie requesting a ride home. At this time, Ryan was with his friend Richie D, who was driving his gray in color Ford F-150 pickup truck with Ryan seated in the front seat and Ryan's girlfriend Heather M seated in the back passenger compartment. Ryan recalls Richie driving down Cedar Crest Road from the direction of the Kennedy Elementary School. As the F-150 approached Fairview, Ryan remembers seeing a set of headlights of a mid-sized black SUV coming from the opposite direction of Cedar Crest. Subsequently, Richie yielded to the vehicle, allowing it to make a right-hand turn onto Fairview as their car then followed, making a left-hand turn onto Fairview. Continuing on, Ryan went on to say that their F-150 remained in front of the home for a period of time that was no longer than five minutes. So he 
and it's um well him and his friends did not stay there for any longer than five minutes in his assumption uh, his sister Julie came out of the home and asked if the three of them would like to come inside. Ryan refused the invite. Julie stated that she wanted to stay a little longer. This is her changing her story again and then would likely spend the night at the house. But upon conclusion of their conversation, Julie retreated back inside the home and Ryan noticed that the SUV pulled up a few, a few, few feet into the car uh, to the far edge of the property line between 34 and the neighboring property where the flagpole was located along the, with some bushes. So you've seen the spot in other um, images that I've shared. You've seen um, where his body was lying, where it was found in front of the home. So that is where they're saying Karen's car was. Ryan stated that the SUV driver did not appear to place the vehicle into park as the rear rear brake lights were illuminated to include the third top tier light. And so he never saw, so the lights were on the whole time. So he would have noticed if there was a crack, basically. Trooper Proctor asked Ryan if at any point he heard screams, yelling, or any noise coming from the black SUV while he was at Fairview. To which he stated, no. Ryan added that as Richie pulled away from 34 Fairview, their F-150 drove past the black SUV, at which time Ryan observed the interior light on and a Caucasian female operator seated inside the vehicle holding the steering wheel at the 10 and 2 looking straight ahead of her. Ryan told us that he did not see anyone else inside the passenger compartment during his brief observations of the SUV as they drove by it. Ryan did not see the SUV leave, and he did not note any damage to the vehicle as he remembers. That is a strong statement. Strong for the defense. That's why it's number three. <laughs> number two on the list is Apple Data Health proves O'Keefe went up and down stairs, which he could not have done uh, if he was not inside Brian Albert's house, if he went inside, then Reed could not have run him over. So this is a petition by the defendant that was filed 10 In point of fact, a review of O'Keefe's exported Apple Health data clearly shows him climbing three flights of stairs at some unspecified time between 1221 and 1224 a.m., not at the arbitrary time Trooper Garino chose for purposes of his argument. Um, so here is, according to an affidavit of a cell phone forensic expert named Richard Green, and this was an expert hired by the defense to analyze the Apple Health steps, or, well, all of the um, phone extraction data information. He uh, reviewed all of it, but this in particular, we're talking about G John's steps. His Apple Health data shows him he took these steps. Um, so at 12 11, 170 steps, 12 21. So that's probably him getting out of the bar going out of the bar and getting into Karen's car at 12 21 which we know is about the time that they arrive at the home uh he takes 80 steps 12 31 36 steps and then at 604 in the morning 432 steps obviously somebody picked up the phone at that point and um took over his, um, their health data was being recorded as John's. But the important thing that we see here is that the steps, he took steps at 1221, which is around the time that they arrived. And then at 30, uh, 36 steps at 1230. So he was, he was moving around. He wasn't just sitting in a car or 
just standing like if you if he just got out of the car and was just standing there he would have not taken any steps either so this also proves that he moved from where he was after getting out of the car all right so down here though is the important thing it says he ascended floors so at 12:22 so right after he gets inside or maybe it is actually in fact registering as he did go up a flight of stairs because there is a, a, a few stairs that you have to go up to get into the Albert house. Maybe about six steps or something like that, seven steps. So he would have had to have taken those steps. So that could have been one flight. So that would have been when he arrived there, 1221, 1222. And then, um, but he took three flights of stairs, of steps, not just one, but three at this time so we know he had to have gone in the house unless he was just climbing up and down the front steps i doubt it so between the time period of 12 22 and 12 24 is when he made his flights of going up and down the stairs we the, unfortunately we don't know if he went up or down but we do know he had three, three flights of steps that he went on. All right. So now we're at number one. Ta-da! And I actually broke it down number one and num- to one A and one B. And I just added one quick one, um, which I'm sure Turtle Boy won't <laughs> disapprove. All right. So one um, A, Turtle Boy's number one reason why... Um, there's a cover-up and Karen is being framed is because Proctor intentionally chose not to interview eyewitness plow driver Lucky Loughran, who was willing to tell him that O'Keefe's body was not on Brian Albert's lawn at 2.30 a.m. and that he would have seen a body had he been there. If there is no body at 2.30 a.m., then Karen Reed could not have unalived John at 12.30 a.m just couldn't so here is the supplemental affidavit of attorney alan jackson because this is part of lucky's statement after ms reed filed the motion 17 um the filed the rule 17 motion for dpw snowplow records assistant district attorney Adam Lally produced to the defense a record interview of Brian, a recorded interview of Brian Laughlin. And I just want to point out that this is the only recorded interview. Every other interview with all the other witnesses has not been recorded and it has not been verified or signed by the witness themselves. It's all in the troopers' words or the police officers' words. So that's a problem that none of the eyewitness statements are signed. But also, it's a problem that nobody's interviews or anything were recorded except for Lucky's. All right, so interviewed by uh, Buchanan and Trooper Proctor on August 10th. As we said, this is a year and nine months after O'Keefe's passing. Brian's... um, Here's Brian's statement. So Sergeant Buchanan starts by, but that day you didn't see anything suspicious. Brian says, no. Sergeant Buchanan says, does that to you, does that mean that you definitely, that you were, that there was definitely nobody there? Or do you think it might have been obstructed by something if you were driving by or what? What's your understanding of it? Uh, I saw nobody. Uh, my truck is high enough with the lights that I would have seen a body. Uh, I can't answer to say if there was something obstructing me, I, I didn't see anything obstructing me. So you didn't see any tire tracks. You didn't see any blood trails being dragged, a body being dragged there. Correct. And you didn't hit the body, right? If you hit the body, you would correct. Have, you would have, I would have, I would have known. You would have notified. Whoops. Oh, shoot. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Darn mouse. 
Um, I would have. I would have A, known about it, and B, I would have known. I would have been required to stop and make a phone call to my supervisor and then the necessary phone call to police and fire. That's protocol for the town. So there you have it. Lucky law friend says he would have known. He didn't see anything. He didn't see anything suspicious. He didn't see a body, but he did see a Ford Edge. And that alone is worth looking into. All right. And then I added one B to Turtle Boy's list. Even though he already mentioned the feds, I brought it up again because after worried, after learning that some of the witnesses in attendance the night of January 29th were summoned to testify in a grand jury, the Norfolk District Attorney's Office initiated contact with federal agents in the eight letters that we discussed earlier that were disguised, very thinly disguised, as pleas for discovery so that they could graciously hand it over to the defense in a timely manner. That was their excuse as to why they needed to know the information that the feds knew about this case. Whatever the feds were doing, they needed to have that info so that they could just turn it over in timely manner to the defense because they had an obligation for discovery. So just the mere fact that the district attorney's office would reach out to the FBI and ask them, have the balls to ask them these questions, it's crazy. But anyways, so these letters reveal that the Norfolk district attorney's office is likely the target of the federal investigation, not just the Norfolk district attorney's office, but also the investigators involved, potentially the, the um, law enforcement we may see. So um, I just wanted to give you a little overview of um, the letters we did receive. So um, they've been outed now. They're public. The uh, U.S. Attorney's Office publicly stated, we don't mind if any of this comes to light and we don't mind that you make these letters public. So that is why they are now public. You can see that Joshua Levy um, wrote to the first assistant district attorney and here the Office of Professional Responsibility from the U.S. Justice Department wrote Michael Morrissey and we will read those and get a little deeper into those next time. I hope you join me. I really would love to hear um, what you guys think of this so far. What is the most damning piece of exculpatory evidence for Karen, that's the most damning for the state. What do you think? What do you think it shows um, guilt for the state that something nefarious is going on? Let me know in the comments below. Tell me what you think. Um, tell me, yeah, just give me your thoughts. I'm dying to like talk about this case with someone because it's so, I'm so deep in, in into it that, um, you know, sometimes it's like nice to hear other people's perspectives and things. So please, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Bye-bye.